Ladies and gentlemen, uh, a very warm welcome to the very first session uh, at this conference, Natural Resources. And my name is Christina, and I'm very happy uh, to chair this session. And I'm very happy to introduce you on our uh, first presenter. The rules of this team are we have 20 minutes to present, there's a five minutes discussion, and then other five minutes to the audience. So I'd like to have a look here. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the first session. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about uh, internal migration and energy poverty. This is uh, John Pork with Leona, who's sitting there. Uh, so what's the story behind this paper? Uh, a couple of years ago with Leona, we were working on household uh, energy choices in Tanzania using panel data. And we found out that households were progressing very slowly uh, during our ladder. And this was in line with the finding of the literature showing that even when we have massive uh, investments in electrification programs in rural Africa, households are very slow to adopt electricity and to use electricity. But what is common to all these studies is that they either look at rural households or urban households. So with Leon now we're wondering what would happen if we are looking at households that not only experience a change in their access to electricity, but also a variation in their environments. And by environment, I mean two things. The first one is a change in access to substitutes to electricity, and also a change in uh, energy use practices around them. So that's why we decided to look at internal migrants, uh, and in South Africa, because there is excellent migration and uh, energy data in South Africa. So, as we all know, uh, the African continent has been experiencing uh, significant structural changes over the past decades, and this has been accompanied by a rapid urbanization. Um, and what we see today is that local authorities are struggling to meet the demand for urban amenities in terms of um, uh, jobs, transportation, education, energy, water and sanitation, and so on. And we can expect that those challenges will grow over time. Um, and this urbanization has also been accompanied by the expansion of informal settlements, which are basically sites concentrating um, multidimensional deprivation. And we are interested in energy, uh, simply because energy uh, is a bottleneck to improve livelihoods. And I won't, I won't have to say this in this room, but uh, access to modern energy services uh, will be a way to realize a number of sustainable development goals. So when we think of countries like uh, South Africa and in a world of limited resources, for policymakers, the question is, where should we invest? Should they invest in urban areas where electrification rates are still quite good, uh, although we're still a bit far away from universal electrification? Or should they invest in rural areas where electrification rates still lag behind cities uh, but where the marginal cost of electrification is very high because of dispersed habitats. So now a bit about the uh, South African context. Um, so there is a significant history of uh, migrant labor. And South Africa has experienced uh, those structural changes early on compared to neighboring countries. Uh, and what is interesting is that at the same time we have very high electrification rates, uh, with 90% uh, across the country. Uh, but when we look at rural areas, we still have a high prevalence of um, use of traditional fuel use, um, charcoal and firewoods. But what we could learn from South Africa and could be useful for other countries um, is this similar coexistence of multi multiple forms of habitats with uh, informal areas and formal areas, both within rural areas and urban areas. So, so then when we start thinking about migration, internal migration, and the gains in terms of energy poverty, when we start accounting for this existence of both formal and informal areas, it's not so clear that migrants are going to gain from migration. So this is our uh, research question. Uh, so basically we're asking whether um, rural urban migration do result in a decline in energy poverty for migrants. And we're also asking whether the energy poverty outcome of migrants depends on the choice of destination, that is, uh, formal settlements or informal settlements. 
So in this paper, we're going to use panel data over 10 years, uh, and for which we have individual and household level information at destination and origin. Um, and we also have some very nice uh, energy uh, level information. We're going to use a difference in different setting uh, and an event study approach to take benefit of the panel structure of our data. Uh, we're also going to consider receiving and sending households to see if we have varying effects between the migrants, uh, the household where they migrate to, and the, the household that they left. And we're also going to look at other amenities like water and sanitation to see what types of other gains uh, they could get from migration. So what do we know about um, internal migration and energy poverty? Not so much. Um, there is this very interesting paper showing that in the case of South Africa, uh, the improvements in energy access has not been monotonic over time and that this could be due to the dissolution of households over time. So the, the authors don't really go into uh, the topic of migration, but they raise the idea that migration could be one reason to explain why some households were connected to electricity and later on disconnected to electricity. Uh, then there are some papers, uh, one paper looking at um, migration in Zambia and finding that uh, those migrating to cities tend to uh, rely less on firewoods. Um, and, and then there's the broader literature on the gains from migration, uh, which is really what we're trying to contribute on. Um, notably, there are some papers showing that when we look at migration, we should not only look at the gains for the migrants themselves, but also for the sending and receiving households. Um, and in the case of South Africa, Garlic find that there is a gain from migration for the individual migrants, but uh, there is a loss for uh, the, the receiving households. So we use the National Income Dynamic Study data, uh, which is a great uh, data set uh, covering five ways from 28 to 2017. At baseline, we had 28,000 uh, individuals that were tracked over the five ways. Uh, because there was a very high attrition rate for uh, white and Indian populations, we decided to drop them from the sample, thus just focusing on black and colored respondents. Uh, but it's not so much of an issue because when we look at their migration pattern, they migrate uh, much less compared to black and colored respondents. Um, and also we have some very detailed information about cooking, light and fuel, uh, electricity access, and energy expenditure. So when it comes to measuring energy poverty, I think we could discuss for three days uh, about the right measure. Uh, we decided to use the multidimensional energy poverty index. So this index uh, varies from zero to one, uh, one meaning that an individual is uh, energy poor, and it's a combination of different measures looking at access to electricity, but also how energy is being, is being used in the household. So we have information about uh, the energy source for cooking, uh, we have information about access to the grid, and then information about ownership of um, a stove, fridge, telephone, radio, and television. This indicator may have many issues, but the information to construct it is of high quality in most household surveys, which is not the case for expenditure data. So what we're going to do in this paper is that we're going to use the MEP index as our main indicator for energy poverty, but then also run the results on each component of the MEP and also look at the findings using uh, expenditure, energy expenditure, um, and uh, see if uh, that corroborates our findings. Um, when we look at the MAP over our 10-year uh, period, we see that energy poverty has uh, decreased quite a lot in South Africa, uh, from 30% to 10%. Uh, that is a 20 percentage point decrease uh, over 10 years. Um, and what's interesting is that this decrease is driven by the decrease in rural areas, where we had a 20, yeah, a 30 percentage point decrease uh, and only 10 in urban areas. Um, another interesting fact is that the decrease in energy poverty over those 10 years has been higher than the decrease in monetary poverty. Now let's look at migration. Um, so there are many ways to define migration. Um, so in our case, we consider someone to be a migrant when they were observed in one location uh, at one wave and in another 
location at another wave. And we consider someone to be a non-migrant when they stayed in the same location. So if someone migrated from uh, a rural area to a city, they are migrants. If someone migrated from a rural area to a rural area, they're considered as migrants, but a different group. So our control group are really those who were in rural areas before uh, at baseline and stayed in rural areas. And also, uh, we decided in the main specification to consider migrants, those who migrated once and stayed in the same location. Because in the case of South Africa, we have two types of migration. We have monodirectional migration, so someone leaves and stays, and we have uh, circular migration, people who just move in and back, back and forth, back and forth. Um, so that's something we had considered, but uh, technically it becomes a bit um, challenging to really understand what's going on. And just to give you an idea, uh, when we look at our baseline respondents, we have 90% of wave one respondents in rural areas who happen to migrate at some point over the 10 years. And when it comes to monodirectional migration, I think it's about 10% of our sample. Uh, and the other interesting fact about uh, migration here is that when we look at wave-to-wave -wave migration, we have 30% of the migrants to cities who migrate into informal areas at each wave. So we are going to look at pre-post migration differences um, and compare the energy poverty outcomes of migrants and non-migrants. So we have... Um, Y, which is our energy poverty indicator for uh, individual I, which is explained by uh, an individual fixed effects, time fixed effects, we have a budget control, education, age, um, household expenditure, household size, and so on. And what we are interested in is beta, uh, which is associated with the treatment, which is being a migrant or not. And then we're going to use the dynamic setup uh, by looking at the effects for each wave. Uh, basically, because we have five waves, we can look at what's happening four waves before the migration or four waves after the migration, depending on when each individual migrated. So when we study uh, migration, uh, the main uh, challenge in the ways is selection into migration. Uh, both for the decision, decision to migrate and the choice of destination. So we try to deal uh, with this in three ways. Um, the first way uh, by including individual and household level baseline controls, uh, which are collated with the decision to migrate. Uh, the second way by uh, comparing early and late migrants. Uh, because we have five ways, we have people migrating, migrating between each way, so we can look if our results hold between early and late migrants, and also by comparing um, rural to urban migrants with uh, rural to rural migrants. Um, the other issue we had to deal with is uh, potentially differential attrition for migrants into informal housing. Uh, and we had to look at this, we checked whether we could have uh, any issue with that, and we find no evidence that those migrating into informal areas show more attrition than, than those uh, migrating to formal areas. Now the results. Uh, so our main results uh, is that rural to urban migrants experience a 16% decline um, from average levels of energy poverty in rural areas. And when we look at the effects of the time, which is the first graph, we see that um, the effect becomes bigger over time. So there is a gain to migrating just after migration, and those gains grow over time. When we look at the components of the energy poverty index, we can see that, uh, this is here, that this decrease in energy poverty is mostly driven by a shift in the type of cooking fuels. I'll come back to this in the conclusion. Uh, and when we look at other dimensions of the index, we see that in terms of access, electricity access, uh, uh, communication access, and so on, there was no so much gain compared to those who stayed in rural areas. Um, 
Now, when we look at uh, comparing informal housing uh, with formal housing, what is striking is that uh, uh, those migrating into informal areas experience no gain in the wave directly after migration. However, after the second wave after migration, they started to experience gains into energy poverty. Um, when it comes to access to sanitation and water, there are clear gains from migrating to cities. Um, and those are quite consistent. Uh, then we also looked at any gender effect, and we don't find any differences between uh, women migrants and men and men migrants. Um, and finally, when we look at uh, receiving households and selling households, we don't find any variation of energy poverty for receiving households, uh, but we do find small decline in energy poverty for selling households, which could be due to remittances. So. Our main finding in this paper is that um, when individuals migrate to cities, they tend to gain in terms of energy poverty, and this shift is due to change in cooking fuels. And what's interesting is that when we look at the literature focusing only on rural areas, when there is an electrification program, households switch for lighting, but not for cooking. So I always also suggest that when there are substitutes to fire, uh, firewood and charcoal, households have no incentive to switch to electricity for cooking. That's one assumption. Um, the other main result is that for those migrating to informal settlements, um, the gains are much smaller in terms of energy poverty, especially at the wave uh, after migration. And that concerns uh, around 30% of uh, new urban residents uh, after each wave. So it's quite significant. Um, so in, in the case of South Africa, uh, the difference between um, urban electrification and rural electrification is not that pronounced. So what would be interesting is to conduct a similar study in other African countries where there is a big, di bigger divide between urban and rural electrification because we suspect that the gains from migration uh, would be uh, much higher. And thank you. And time. <laughs> Okay, <clears throat> so uh, I, I just had a few um, a few comments on it. So overall, I think the paper is great. Um, I think it's a very important topic to understand the so-called environmental footprints of migration, right? Um, and migration is a topical issue now, not really in the, in the sense of internal migration, but external migration has, has covered a lot of the news. And I think the fact that um, you have very good longitudinal data to track individuals and, and help us to understand what really are the energy use choices of, of migrants is it's, it's very useful, particularly for policy discussions. But I guess the essence for today is not just to praise your people, but to I mean, also offer comments in areas where I think maybe the people can improve. And I have three key things. Um, so the first one is to really to try for us to understand what really is the mechanism behind it. Right? And here I think there are about two things that are going on. There's what I call the demand and then the supply side effect. If I migrate from a rural area to an urban area, it's either, I mean, most people migrate, particularly for rural urban, it's many income, right? So I get income, my income levels increase, and that can afford me to, I mean, choose better like energy technologies, right? So that's one. So that's what I call the demand side. I'm able to demand more. But on the supply side too, maybe the housing, um, like issues in the urban center, because you can't cook in, if you live in an apartment complex, you can't put a four stove there and, and be using it, right? So the housing quality or the housing systems in the urban area will force you to choose a particular type of technology, right? And maybe even in the urban centers, you don't have free access to firewood as you would in the, in the rural areas. The question is, which of these effects is at play in the paper? And I don't think, um, at least I, I didn't really get a sense of which of these is it's, it's really driving. And, and, and I suggest that you probably have a mechanism section where you'll be able to tease out whether it's the demand story or the supply story, or even if it's both. And I think that can enrich the analysis. The second point relates to the outcomes. So um, although, I mean, you show that 
you focus on the, I mean, in the paper, the individual component, I think the paper is heavily focused on the MEPI. And I, I, I know people have used it, but the intuition behind the index, especially, is not very clear to me. And I think we also acknowledge that there are so many ways that people measure these. And so my suggestion is probably to focus more on the individual components, because I think the individual components are very much intuitive and, and, and it's easy for people to understand what really is going on. My last point relates to the identification. And in your presentation, you mentioned the issue of selection bias, which is big. Migration is not random, and I think we all know it. Uh, now, how to address it, uh, I'm not saying I'm an expert on this, but I think it would be good to think more about, about other alternative mechanisms. And here, I think I have about two things. So, I think, I mean, there's a nice paper by Arnold in the AJ that would use the coarse exact matching approach. Given that you have panel data that is quite detailed, you'll be able to use that to match them on, on like pre, um, match migrants versus non-migrants using these nine characteristics and then track them over time, right? Um, I, I really encourage you, to think, encourage you to take a look at that. The second point relates to the, the whole discussion on two-way fixed fed and staggered treatment, right? Because as you mentioned, the migration decisions move from some people moving with one, some people moving with two, with three, and, and etc. So there's some level of staggered treatment. And I think today, you cannot, if you have a paper in that, that has this staggered treatment, you cannot get away with reviewers, right? If you don't talk about it. And I think, given that, I mean, one way to avoid the selection issue would be, um, I mean, if you, if you use the stack difference in difference approach, right? And again, there's a good paper in Restart now that looks at um, on the effect of probation on fan performance. And what they basically do is they focus on fan that um, I mean, I've talked about the at one point in time. So that's the sample. What they are actually using is that, I mean, the treatment is essentially the timing of the treatment, right? And so they're able to observe before and after what happens. And, and I suggest this thing could be, that maybe help you improve the paper. But I'll stop here, since my red card is almost up. Thanks. Thank you. Like I think I suggest you yeah, collect your comments. So now it's up to you. Yeah. Um, there is a question in the middle. Now you have to ask. Yeah. Okay. Hi, thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, I just want a question comment connected to the question in the comments and the weights of the two days So um, are the weights um, uh, assigned by choice or are they calculated now? In, in the the ways to the different questions in calculate the level of index. Oh, it's already given. It's already given. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> because I'm thinking there is a you know, food security literature, what they do with the different questions on food security. They end up using all the information available in the different indices and calculate the principal component. Mm -hmm. So you can actually use all the information present and weigh them by the reports and the others. So this is something we might have to think about in implementing the, the issue with having our the calculation of the Thank you. Yeah, so my comments is essentially very similar to his. Is, is the, 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 the weights are, can change quite a bit if you look across countries, right? And so the one way to kind of get around this would be to do kind of like a factor analysis that allow the data to say, What's the reason to be? There is one question in the phone. Sorry, there is one question in the phone. I was just wondering if you have any sketch, if you observe it, which is like an alpha, is it all going to be considered in substance, especially in the place where we're looking to their alpha? Maybe like a possible extension by change by changing and choose behavior to help us have an alpha that. But just the extension. Yeah, well it's my third question, which is very related to indoor cooking. Uh, yeah. I don't think we have any health related data uh, in the waste data. Do we? Oh you yeah. every every day. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any questions, comments? I, um, I have a comment that I was thinking about. I'm you showing your graphs and your events and that 
threats is that basically you don't have viral pre-trans either, uh, which that's descriptively it's very interesting, but then in a the sense you could also comment or think about what does it mean that uh, they have been improving already beforehand. So in, in order to become a migrant, uh, actually you need some additional income, and so that's just why you, you see no viral pre-trans, which makes the pre percentage a bit more problematic, but at the same time descriptively I think it's still a very useful thing to think about. Thank you. <coughs> yes. So, just on this point, um, I can tell you the later, I know of a paper whether to be adults people who look at electrification and whether that changes your propensity to migrate. Right? So, um, so, given that literature, it's, it's, it's really hard to read that. So, it's, it's a different setup, even with sort of the modern um, machinery. Is, Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, just to the back. Okay, so I'm going to talk about COVID, and I guess almost everyone in this room is tired of COVID, uh, but hopefully I don't bore you. So our paper is about how I mean, households and families respond to um, the COVID pandemic and using data from Ghana and Rwanda. And this is done with my colleagues, Imabla James and Alexander. So as we know, I mean, no one needs an introduction to the effect of COVID, even for the mere fact that this is the first time we are holding CSA in person since 2019. It's, it's a good testament. Um, but then, I mean, nonetheless, we all know that it brought a lot of disruptions. Um, and given that energy today is more or less like the black line of most modern economies, this presentation cannot go on without electricity. And maybe we won't be freezing to death in the room without enough heating in the room, right? So what this means is that whenever there are disruptions in the global or in the, Anytime there's a disruption in the economy, that could have implications on demand for energy. Um, at a global level, the IE estimated that global energy demand for 2020 fell somewhere within 2 to 3%. Uh, but that's a very big macro number. Behind that are a lot of variations in how household and family responded to this. So if you think of the stay at home orders or lockdowns, fans and um, the demand responses of fans and households are likely to be different. Right? I worked from home for almost two years. And so my electricity bill started going up because I was using more energy. And I guess my employer didn't pay enough electricity because there was no one in the office, right? Um, at the same time, we all know during the pandemic, many countries offered a lot of programs, uh, but some of them included electricity subsidies. Uh, as they suggest, around 17 countries offered direct subsidies around the world. Uh, but as economists, we know subsidies are good, but it can also have unintended consequences, right? Uh, the fact that it's free, you could consume more, uh, but also, also it, there are also other unintended consequences in terms of the welfare I mean, implications, especially if there are leakages in the implementation of these subsidies. Well, not to talk too much, what exactly are we doing in, in this paper? Basically, to try to understand the demand responses of households and firms um, in two African countries, and these two countries are very important in the sense that they have different, somewhat different policies during the period. Ghana had a bit of a partial lockdown in, in the two main cities. Um, Rwanda imposed a full lockdown, um, I mean, across the country. But then Ghana offered subsidies. Rwanda said, no, we, we're not going to offer subsidies. So already, you can see a little bit of difference. So the idea was have tried to look into the data in this country to try and see whether the responses were different. Um, and, and also to try to see whether uh, I mean, there's any room for electricity subsidies in any rating consumption in this in this country, if any. So to convince you to stay, let me give you a bit of headline and numbers in terms of what we find. Well, essentially, we find that even though residential consumption increased in the, the two countries, the effect was way larger in Ghana than in Rwanda. Um, and and this later on we found that it's the subsidies were, I mean, obviously part of it. Uh, 
in the res non-residential sectors, we saw a bit of a decline, but I mean, a lot of the sectors that were hit were consolidated by hotels and, and, and commercial areas. A little bit of context so that we all understand the issues, I mean, that the two countries were. So both of them recorded their first COVID case just about the same time. But then differences started, I mean, happened, right? One imposed the partial lockdown, one the other imposed the full lockdown. The lockdown in Ghana was pretty short later, just about three weeks. But Rwanda's lockdown was a bit long for about two to three months. Um, I've talked about the subsidies. But another interesting thing to know about the contest is that the, in Rwanda, it's almost universal in a prepaid return, right? With a certain very large industries, everybody's on prepaid. What as an economist, what tells us is that the the constraint is binded, right? If you are locked down and if you're on prepaid return and if you don't have income and your credit on your meter runs out, it means you are, your electricity is just going to more or less go off. But in Ghana, I think majority of the people are already on, like on prepaid, right? And so even when they are staying at home, they can still consume, right? Because it's sort of a deferred payment. There's also issue of access rate, but that doesn't really matter because everybody we are staying here is conditional on access. All right, what type of data do we use? Uh, we use administrative data on billing records of households and friends in these countries. Uh, and very large data sets, uh, but I won't bore you with the details. But essentially, for each customer in the data set, we know how much they consume each month in terms of the kilowatt hours, the monetary value, also the type of customers, whether residential, non-residential. And I must say that the Rwanda data was even much more detailed. So you could know within the non-residential sector what type of customer they are, whether they are um, hotels or I mean health centers or uh, maybe a church or whatever it is. You'll be able to identify those inside. And, and then we also added a bit of climate data, essentially temperature and then precipitation data. Now, in my in my previous comments, I talked about identification, uh, not to pretend that I know it all. But the biggest challenge in this, in this work is that identification, right? What COVID was, everyone was affected by COVID. How do you identify, credibly identify, treat it, and then control it? Uh, the other thing also is that seasonality, right? And then you use part things that are highly correlated with the time of the year, right? And so just taking a pre-post difference could be picking up the role of seasonality, right? So I guess after saying this point, I should stop and not even continue with the paper because it's almost impossible to deal with it. But um, in the event of first best solution, will not be available even for second best solutions. So what we try to do is that for each household of fame, what we try to do is with the counterfactual, in other words, what would have been the level of consumption in the absence of COVID? We say, well, let's look at the average consumption in the same month in the two previous years without COVID, right? And with that, we can infer what the average levels of consumption would be in a given time period. And then also, we do the analysis within months, right? So if you move from January to February, maybe that will be picking I mean, more or less differences in seasons, right? So we are doing within month comparisons. Essentially, the baseline model that we estimate is this one. So our left hand side is the log of your consumption for customer I month M and then time T. We control for customer level fixed effect, location by year fixed effect. Now, um, let's see if I can use this. Okay, so these are event time damage, right? So for each of the months who's COVID. So in Rwanda, their lockdown was um, somewhere in the middle of March, right? And so we, we treat March as the start of the COVID period. And we are looking at all the months after, after that period. So this is for, uh, I mean, the dummies for each of the months after March, so March to December 2020. This is the same event dummies for the same period in the years 2018 to 2019, right? Um, essentially, um, what we're trying to do here is to compare the differences in consumption during the post-COVID months, which we classify March to December, right? Um, for the same consumer between 2020 and then the average levels for the previous years, right? And of course, the reference period here will be the month of January and February across all the three periods. So our treatment effect is essentially the coefficient of each of the monthly dummies for the 2020 less the average of, of, the, of the treatment effect for the, for the same month, but then in the, in the two previous years. And what we're seeing here is that we're measuring the changes in consumption during the COVID month. So essentially think of rolling back the COVID period to the previous years, right? Compared to, um, I mean, the average consumption in the typical months in the previous years. 
Um, now, these effects, we estimate them month on month, but let me just start with some average, I mean, like, effects. So, essentially, uh, the treatment effects that we are focusing on is, this, is these ones, right? So, this is essentially, this 0 0.026 minus the average of 0 0.16 and then minus 0 0.02. Um, I, I mean, that's the way to think about it, but these are just the average effect. I'll, I'll, I'll go into the monthly effect. But this is the result for Rwanda. Overall, if you look at column two, the results pretty much, I mean, for, across all customers, consumption levels didn't really increase that much, just around 2%. Residential was around 4%. Non-residential, I mean, it was a decline, right? Around 12, around 12%. Small and medium industries, we don't really find any effect. Um, but let's look at the details, the month on month, let me change this. Again, one thing I must question, don't think of this as an event study where you try to look at the events before and after, right? I'm just summarizing the month and month effect um, in the graphs. Now, you see the vertical bars is essentially the period when the country was in lockdown, right? Overall, you see one month into the, into the lockdown, consumption levels fell about 2% in Rwanda. And then after, after the COVID lockdown, consumption levels increased above even the pre-COVID levels. It's interesting to see for residential levels that, uh, I mean, the consumption levels were always higher, um, I mean, than the pre-COVID levels. Um, but again, the magnitudes here are not very large in the case of Rwanda. For non-residential, again, consumption levels fell. It was always negative. The change was always negative, um, mainly because, I mean, if you think of the work from home and then also the, a, lot of, a lot of offices had to close, particularly during the COVID lockdown period. For small and medium industries, the effect is negative mainly during the lockdown period, but beyond that, it bounces back to the COVID numbers. Uh, but let's take, like I mentioned, the Rwanda data is a bit detailed, so within the non-residential, we could delve deeper to look at the various categories. So we have, these are for commercial buildings, these are offices and then retail shops, we have hotels, you have health centers, and then public works. Now, as you see, the, if you look at commercial buildings, the, the effect is negative throughout the period, although it was mostly severe during the lockdown and then started bouncing back, but it never really got to the pre-COVID levels. And the same for hotels, uh, but for health centers and public works, we don't find any uh, effect. Now let's go to Ghana. Again, we present the same average effect and then we go deeper. Now if you look at the numbers in Ghana, the effect are pretty large. Uh, somewhere around 20%. Overall, residential is around, if you do the numbers, if you do the math, it's around 20, 20 to 23%. For non-residential, it's quite small, um, around 6%. And then for heavy industries, it was a negative, I mean, a severe one. But if you look at the dynamic effects, this is how it looks like. Again, for residential, it was always high. Um, for non-residential, um, it's, I mean, it's pretty flat after the lockdown period. And look at for heavy industries. It's, it was really negative, right? I'm doing the COVID lockdown period, but then once the lockdown was lifted, um, it started bouncing back, but never recovered to pre-pandemic levels. Uh, the question was, given that the lockdown in Ghana was partial in the sense that certain cities were selected and not everywhere, could, could there, are there any differences between the effects between lockdown areas and non-lockdown areas? And we don't find any any significant effect. Um, I mean, well, the trend seems to be more or less pretty much the same across the board. Then the question is the the most important question is what was the role of the subsidies that was offered? But before that, let me give you a bit um, insight into what the subsidy was about. So on 31st March 2020, the president announced, "Hey, we are going to give everybody three months subsidy." But there are two levels of subsidies. Some group are going to get 100% subsidy, others are going to get 50% subsidy. And the criteria is based on your consumption in the month of March, right? That was on the, on the mid, around evening of 31st March. So it was impossible for anyone to manipulate because your consumption has already been determined. So lifeline customers, which are people who consume less than 50 kilowatt hours in that month of March, were going to get 100% subsidy for three months. If you're above that, sorry, you're only going to get 50%. However, at the end of the three months, the government then extended the 100% subsidy for the lifeline customer up to cumulatively up to a, a one year, but a non-lifeline customer, they didn't get any extension, right? And so what we're trying to do here is to understand the role of subsidies, we do two things. The first one is to replicate the, the analysis we did before, 
by just splitting the sample into resident um, log, um, sorry, um, lifeline and then non-lifeline non customer. And then the second part is to really exploit the unexpected extension of the subsidies for the non-lifeline customers, right? So given that non-lifeline people, their subsidy ended, but others continued, we try to run a different diff here, basically. So what we're going to see is what was the effect of the, think of this as a subsidy removal for the non-lifeline customers, right? And try to see how much that really affected I mean, their consumption. So the first one is where we replicate the main analysis, but separately for lifeline and non-lifeline customers. And you see the clear difference. So the blue line are the people who enjoyed 100% subsidy. The, the increase in their consumption was really substantial. For non-lifeline customers, so the red bars are here basically indicating the period for the first round of the subsidies, right? Both of them were getting subsidies during this period, although the difference was in the magnitude of the subsidy, 100% versus 50%. Now, for the non-lifeline, immediately after their subsidies ended, their consumption level even declined. The weird thing was what happened in the last month of, of um, uh, December. It's still puzzling, but if you look at the gap, the gap is huge. Now, let's look at when we run the model, just basically focusing on the, what is the effect of the subsidy removal. Now, what we find is that the subsidy removal for the non-lifeline customers, right, reduce their consumption by around 17%, right? Now, if you think of it the other way around, in other words, these people, right, the moment the subsidy I mean, was removed, their consumption reduced by about 17%. In other words, it tells us, it gives us a sense of the potential effect of the subsidies, right, on, on their consumption, right? Um, the final thing that we do here is to try to see how much did each of these groups of customers go, right? Uh, because initially, when the policy was announced, I mean, there was a debate as to the fact that the design of the policy was regressive because people who consume more, if you consume $200 a month of electricity, and the government is giving you effectively $100 free, right? But for the low income or lifeline consumers, even if they are getting 100%, the population was really low, right? So what we, we tried to do was to do some back of the envelope calculation to see really how much were people getting. The, the, the amount of implicit subsidy that was given to, to I, I mean, both lifeline and non-lifeline customers. So what we do is that for the, given that we have administrative data on the exact consumption of each of these customers, we are able to back out the implicit numbers, right? Now, if you look at it, if you look at it on the monthly level, the median non-lifeline customer, which we can see a high or a medium income customer, what about 29 Ghana cities? At the same year at the time, it's around five US dollars, right, a month. The lifeline customers got 12 cities, which is around uh, 2.5 dollars a month. Now, on the, on the basis of this, you would think the policy is regressive because it's giving more to high income households. However, given that the policy, the subsidy was extended for a year for the low income households, if you aggregate it over the entire period, the blue people, the non-lifeline, they only got it for three months, which is cumulatively there, it's about 86 cities, which is approximately about $15, and that they receive during the entire three months. But low-income household got it for one year, right? Which, I mean, sums up to around $25 over the entire period. So what we're saying is that the extension of the program itself meant that the policy was inherently not, I mean, regressive, as, I mean, earlier criticisms made it look like, right? Um, However, these are also subject to caveat, right? Um, all these are based on assumption that people are actually receiving the, the, I mean, the payment. That's been, if, you, if you know the Ghana contest very well, people live in multi-family compounds, right? And so it's, it's possible that even in these places, a lot of low-income people, since they are on the same joint meter, they, I mean, their consumption levels will bunch into a very high category, and et cetera. But what we are saying is that on the basis of the data that we are picking up here, the policy itself was not that regressive. So just to conclude, Basically, what we find is that, yes, the pandemic actually led to an increase in consumption. But as we all know, subsidies, though they are good, can lead to unintended consequences in the sense that there could be excess consumption, particularly for beneficiary households. So I think my red card is almost up, so let me stop here. Oh, I still have time. Anyway, that's all I have for today. Thanks.
Okay, um, thank you, Justice. Um, I'm just going to read my comment and not prepare any presentation in these slides. Okay. Um, so, yeah, the, the paper is well written. I really enjoyed it. Uh, but I'm, I must say that I'm not ex an expert in, in the methodology because I've not used it before. But I understand it. Um, so I focus on households, so not talking about firms, and I focus on the aspects of subsidies. Okay? And uh, so I'll read my comment. So uh, many studies have reported an increase in electricity use during the pandemic by households worldwide, not just in study. And the reasons are not far fetched. And the results of this particular paper show that both countries, with and without utility subsidies, experience this increase, Rwanda and Africa. So I think that the bone of contention here shouldn't be whether or not there was an increase in energy consumption during the pandemic, but the welfare impact of subsidy comparing the experimental country, Ghana, and control Rwanda as it were. Now, the authors alluded to this when they said that, in quotes, findings highlight the potential effects of pandemic relief measures on household welfare, end of quote. However, this has not been well addressed in the paper, as I would argue that an increase in energy consumption does not necessarily translate to the welfare improvement. The authors have only shown that the subsidy given to households in Ghana leads to a higher electricity consumption than their counterparts in Rwanda. Also, lifeline consumers, those on low income, uh, on low income giving a 100% 12 month subsidy, consume more energy than non lifeline consumers who enjoyed a 50% subsidy for the first three months. There is no comparison in terms of their welfare, which should be the core. Instead, we have a back of the envelope calculation of the subsidies worth for the lifeline and non lifeline households. Two, another challenge in this paper is to disentangle the effect of the subsidy on energy consumption from that of other non monetary relief packages, such as free food and other essentials offered to households in Rwanda and Ghana. These non-monetary relief packages could have income and substitution effects on families' consumption, including electricity, as their disposable income increases, making energy relatively cheaper. The authors should be cautious in attributing the difference in energy consumption among households in Rwanda and Ghana to the subsidy policy in Ghana. The reasons are simple. Could the connection rates influence the difference? How about power availability versus blackout periods? Usage and the number of electric electrical gadgets used by households, such as air conditioners, refrigerators, etc. And their effic energy efficiency. Are the families in those two countries homogeneous in these respects? Now, um, the final point which I miss is the policy implications and recommendations, which is very, very important. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. Is that understood correctly? I think um, not only could you implement the difference in difference science you did there, we could also do a, a difference in discontinuity actually around this threshold, uh, which would even improve your identification comparing only those shortly below the threshold to get into the 100% versus not just only the Thanks. Okay. One and a half comments, maybe the half comment first. So I'm not quite sure about the focus of the paper. So you do all of this energy type first, and then you talk about the lockdown, and then you expect some interaction with lockdowns, whether that's wise or not, it's a completely different question, but then that really doesn't come up and it's more that you're showing us this as descriptors of how energy consumption has changed, which you could do much, much easier without all of this apparatus and descriptors of the aim, um, versus the subsidy part is really true, and, and they had to go much closer to something that you could potentially identify, and you could maybe also get out of this conundrum that you have to subtract the two previous average consumption values from the ones. Um, because you could do something like subtracting exactly the previous year value, uh, and the second you have the lifeline and non-lifeline, that difference would still be identified. So you're you're much closer to sort of the traditional difference into or triple difference setup in this case, where the triple difference would still be there. Um, we can talk about this afterwards, but this sort of there are lots of COVID papers that have done something like this for um, environmental pollution, everyone's like this, and then. Uh, and often it was that the overall shutdown effect or the overall effect of that period is not going to be identified. But some interaction with some heterogeneity that's interesting, which in your case is on my flat part, that will be identified even in very strict settings. Um, so I think you can push this a lot further and potentially make the paper about that. It's more or less exclusive. My impression when we're looking at the trends are out of course, is that the one thing that you are not getting out of the grid of this way is if there is just a general trend in um, electricity access and kind of easy movements that over time that are going to contaminate what you're doing. So looking more into the differential part is really useful because you have this pickup where it's not clear whether it's really still COVID or there is an underlying trend in the new years that you are picking up uh, on top. But it's really super cool data. And then all of it. Very nice. Just one point. Uh, mm -hmm. on, I think you made a point on as to whether I mean, blackouts differences mm -hmm. I mean, across countries could be uh, affected. I think uh, I have data on blackouts in one. Uh, I don't have that. But I think. What they try to do during the pandemic was to try to ensure that the electricity companies do their best at the time right? and to be able to help them. We, we don't see much of I mean, anything out of the ordinary uh, in, in the Rwanda method because we have blackout data, community and right from administrative data, so you know you have implemented quality. Uh, we don't have that data for, for Ghana, so we can come on to speak a bit more about that. But it's, it's probably something that we might need to know that maybe that difference is good, right? Something. Uh, and then on the on the other line trade, I think it's it's, it's a good point to think about. Uh, yeah. And then you can check it after this. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Justice. Great uh, paper. Uh, I really didn't see how it's with the subsidies resulted in excess consumption because uh, from what I um, from what I've seen uh, people were at home so they were consuming more and then they ended up in higher growth for most of these who both got the like progress of both the tariff uh, and then the compensations are for for that uh, extra excess so uh, yeah I, I didn't see how it it encouraged overconsumption of energy. So, if I if I understand your question, you essentially saying that the subsidy kicks in after the first block. Is that what you say? Yeah. 
So that was what I thought before. But speaking with the utility, it was more like your total monthly consumption, you get 50% of the subsidy, right? But then, so someone who was lucky enough, right, to have consumed less than 50 kilowatts in the, in the month of March, who they, whatever they consumed after was, was 100% subsidy, right? Uh, initially, I thought about the same thing, but then when I said to the utility, they were like, no, no. It's, it's kind of weird, but yeah. Okay, thank you. Yes, yeah, so that's an interesting point. Uh, uh, I don't sense to know that the subsidy was regressive or not, right? Beyond the three months, only those on lifeline, we still continue to twist the subsidy. And so, at that point, there's no comparison. I mean, to say that the um, people who were non lifeline consumers also receive the subsidy, so they are the lifeline has basically overcome the subsidy. And then when you when I look at the slide that had the distribution and impact, those who were non lifeline consumers only um, what they thought was higher, only when you did the last four months or over the longer period, for which most of that period, those of non lifeline were not receiving the subsidy anyway. So I, I, I don't have a discussion about the regressive nature of the tax, sorry, of the tax to be beyond you know, the, the, the three months. So, what was that? So, I mean, I guess it depends on how we want to do it. Right? So, if you are looking at what was the, I think the government spent close to a billion dollars on subsidy, I mean, during the period. If you ask, if you ask, I mean, how was this money distributed? So I'm, what I'm talking about is if you look at the entire COVID subsidy, electricity subsidy as a whole, how much of it really went to low income households, how much of it went into middle to high income households. I mean, that's the point that I'm trying to make. But yeah, of course, if you just pick the first three months, you say it was regressive. But if you look at the entire, uh, the entire package, you might say, well, it's, it's a bit different. Okay, thank you very much. Um, our health now is covered and so. Okay, um, so my paper is reducing carbon footprints by Replacing generators with solar EV systems in contingent variation study in Lagos, Nigeria. So this is based on a survey um, I conducted in 2018. Okay. And yeah, so so th this paper has been published already uh, in Environment and Development Economics and it's open access. So well, any comments you give to me, I have to put it forward. <laughs> Okay. Yes, to give me your comments. So I'll learn from there. So motivation. Um, as we all know, um, reports do show that the world is at a, um, a climate tipping point. And we know because of uh, the accumulation of uh, CO2 emissions in the atmosphere, which is uh, linked to uh, the massive burning of uh, fossil fuels, and it's not common, uh, it's more uncommon to hear reports about um, global warming, drought, rising sea levels um, as a result of um, human activities. So, but uh, the main thing is that Africa and um, parts of Asia are the worst hit continent, even though they are, especially Africa, is the least uh, contributor of um, CO2 emissions. But they suffer it the most. So, now the question is as the world races towards net zero carbon emissions by 2050, is Africa ready? <coughs> Especially in terms of uh, energy transition. So, in Sub Saharan Africa, fossil fuel uh, continues to take the lead around 75% um, um, uh, generation is um, fossil fuel. 
whereas the continent is also uh, endowed with renewables like solar. Installed solar PV capacity in this region is just about uh, 5 gigawatts, which is less than 5% of the global total. So it's very poor. And as a result, households and firms resort to generators. And generators produce around 45 gigawatts of power, more than all the renewables generating capacity. So if we look at, uh, so I did those who have without access to electricity and for sea fuel based electricity production, um, Nigeria is here showing that more than 81% of uh, Nigeria's production is uh, power production is for sea fuel based and more than 41% um, is without access to electricity. Now, out of the 45 gigawatts from generators that we see in Sub-Saharan Africa, 13 gigawatts is in Nigeria alone. And also 40% of the total electricity generated by businesses and households using oil products. So as a result of this, um, energy poverty uh, is so high in Nigeria. And due to the use of dirty alternative sources of energy, um, this has a, a health implications, environmental, and noise effects. But Nigeria has shown its commitment to transition or to mitigate um, climate change. So in Paris in 2015, the country showed its commitment by saying that the country is going to reduce CO2 emissions by 20% unconditionally below the business as usual. Uh, by 2030, and 45% below the business as usual condition on international cooperation. So, and we can see these scenarios: you know, the business as usual, uh, the unconditional, um, and the conditional scenario. And again, the country has shown its commitment to a private sector-driven 30 gigawatt upgrade solar PV. These are all policies by the Nigerian government. But we still have constraints on energy transition. Even though many would like to transition, many would like to adopt cleaner sources of energy, but there are a lot of constraints that um, prevent them from doing so. And one of these is um, affordability issues, credit constraints, households, Many households do not have access to credit, and banks do not even give credit to households who want to adopt a new energy. Uh, another factor I have um, observed is what I call myopia or short sightedness. So, because the short run cost of generators is smaller than a solar PV, so people tend to focus on the monetary value in the short run without knowing that in the long run, solar PV is actually cheaper than uh, generators. Another factor is lack of information and information bias. Some do not even know that you can generate electricity uh, from the sun. And many also during the survey believe that electricity uh, from solar um, energy also solar-based electricity cannot power heavy, heavy machinery or equipment. So this is information bias. This actually depends on the capacity of the battery and also the solar panels that you have. So limited participation of women in energy decision-making process and the adoption of uh, the new technologies. And status quo bias. So some actually, or even many, glued to their you know, traditional energy sources. So when you talk about energy transition, it's like a different thing to them. So they do not want to transition because they are used to what they use. And regulatory issues, for instance, high quantity on renewable energy equipment is also another constraint. Of course, the big one that when we talk about Africa, we really need to mention political and 
governance issues, there you would have corruption. So these are some of the constraints to energy transition uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, particularly in Nigeria. But what do we do then if we have this constraint? One way is by helping households through subsidy. Another way is by giving households the opportunity to actually get solar uh, panels, solar energy, while they pay monthly, just the same way they pay for the, uh, electricity from the national grid. So these are two ways. And these two policies are responsible for creating over 300 energy communities across the UK, generating up to 193.9 megawatts of electricity. So Nigeria can borrow this system as well. So that's what we are recommending in this paper, and that's the method we have adopted. One, subsidy, and two, instrument payment. Now, research questions. One is, what is the willingness to pay when solar PV is complemented with a generator? So we really need to know how much households are willing to pay if they are given uh, solar PV or solar PV on their rooftops. And what is the willingness to pay when solar PV completely displaces a generator? By how much would a 20% subsidy change willingness to pay in both scenarios? So in all, we have four scenarios. Okay, when solar PV complements generator and when it does not, when it displaces it completely, then we add 20% subsidy and repeat those two scenarios. We carried out a cost benefit analysis because we want to really know if it is viable uh, for investors or companies to provide. Uh, solar PVs to households while households pay monthly until they complete the payment. So it's really important to, to show companies that it's actually viable to do so. Okay, so the design and data. So we used single bandage like Thomas choice CV questions to elicit, to elicit households with nice to pay. Uh, before we did this, we followed best practices, uh, which is conduct focus group discussion, then, and pilot. So during the pilots, we use open-ended questions and ask households to, um, to, read, uh, to write their, the maximum amount they are willing to pay if uh, solar PV was to be provided for them. So they all did so. And from the amounts we got, we constructed the bid levels so we had five sets of bid levels. And in all, for the four scenarios, we had 20. So these bids uh, were randomly assigned to subsamples of the uh, sample that we surveyed. And we surveyed a total of 350 households. Uh, some might argue that this is uh, too small, but based on the budget we had, even if you increase the number, the sample size, I do not think that the results will change significantly. So this was conducted in Lagos. So Lagos is an urban area in Nigeria. So we selected a few uh, local government areas, which are here, this yellow region. OK, so contingent variation. Um, using single bandage that the most choice question is based on the random mobility models. So basically, uh, we provided the bid and asked household if solar PV was to be provided to them, are they willing to pay this amount? It could be maybe one pound, if I convert it to pound, two pound. So now, if responded I, answers yes, to pay the B, which is the B presented to the household, then it there means that we will assume that the utility that the household receives from the proposed solar PV at waste the utility from the status quo. So the status quo could be generator, it could be you know, um, kerosene lantern, it could be candle, and any other you know, dirty uh, source of energy. So 
Now, y is the level of income. B, as I said, is the bit level. And x, the vector of household characteristics and attributes of the choice, including questionnaire variations. But because we can only estimate the deterministic part of the uh, of this uh, indirect Euclidean function uh, using the uh, model parameters. However, we cannot estimate uh, the random part, which we call it the random the random Euclidean model. So we can only um, we can only make prob probability statement. Okay. Probability statement uh, based on the household response, uh, response. So that is why we have the probability of saying yes is the probability that the perceived utility from the uh, solar PV is greater than the utility from the status quo. Okay? Now, if we include the willingness to pay amount, which makes the individual i indifferent between using the status quo and the proposal PV, then we'll have the third model. Now, when you solve this model, you can derive the mean willingness to pay, which is the fourth equation. So, this is a summary of bits and acceptance rates in the four uh, scenarios. As you can see, Namely, the the bits decline as uh, the acceptance rate declines as the bit level increases in both scenarios. So marginally, for instance, here, but it's still decline. Here in scenario two, decline, increase, decline. Okay. But I just want to show um, in our data that. 72% of households are limited on uh, generator as a backup. Oh, okay. So, we just want to talk about the bid that um, the sign is in line with April, right? So, as the bid increases, the probability of answering yes declines. So, in the first scenario, the mean willingness to pay, as at the time when this analysis was done, was $9.53, uh, $9, around $9 used to pound. And when solar PV completely displaces generators, so the willingness to pay amount increased to $11. Now, in the first scenario, if we give household 20% subsidy, we have around $8. But when solar PV completely displaces generators, then the amount increases significantly to around $14. So in terms of the cost benefits analysis, I'm going to rush. Um, so we find that at 11.5 percent discount rate, it is net positive. If, when we increase the discount rate, it remains positive, showing that it's actually viable or feasible for investors to invest uh, in this, providing uh, solar energy to households while households pay monthly until they complete the, the entire amount, and it's going to take around 15 years to pay back the cost. Okay, so main findings. So the willingness to pay for solar home system or home solar system is higher when it can display generators completely. Generator users are willing to pay more for solar home system than their counterparts only when it can replace generators. And subsidy increases positive bidders by 6%. So on average, solar home systems will save each household around $72 annually from waste to generators. Conclusion. Transitioning to renewable energy will solve many health and environmental problems associated with fossil fuel burning 
and there is a need to subsidize the cost of solar energy. And also, policymakers should promote what I call community energy, which is also common in this country, or a social energy organization, especially among rural households. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a very educational paper for me um, to read, so thanks for the opportunity. And I have to admit, I also encountered my case of myopia, just like the one that you were referring to, because I completely overread on the first page that this paper has been published. So first, what I have done is I sat down and started to comment the paper by line by line, not line by line, but writing all my comments on a PDF. I thought, how nice it is that I'm going to comment on this paper, and at the end, the author might value it. When I read to the end, I commented through it, I realized, oh no, it has been published. So congratulations. It was basically well, I, I, on evening, I, I learned a lot by it, but I, I assume you don't want my comments anymore. No, I want to comment. Take them forward. Take them for whatever. So, um, I'm not going to summarize them. I don't think it's, it's, it's useful. I just want to ask you two questions because I would like to learn a bit more about how we were doing this and why. One of the questions is this, I find it interesting and cool that you're basically using contingent valuation methods. Um, what I was puzzled by is why are you framing it as a voting exercise? So because uh, the text that people had to read was um, if the majority of the country vote or the majority of people voted in favor of for photovoltaic uh, energy, uh, would you say yes or no? And I was so surprised because at the end, it's just an individual's purchase decision. It's not something that we are voting on together as a country and then purchasing photovoltaics together uh, or subsidizing for everyone, but rather it's something that I'm deciding how much am I willing to pay. And so that was, that was one of the questions I was really having a hard time to wrap my head around. Why are you putting it into such a political frame where people are voting about something and, and then what does it mean that you frame this in a way that others have voted yes, now you have to decide whether you join them. So the text says, um, majority in your country voted yes, would you say yes or no? And by that again, I, I was surprised because again, you're framing them so hard. Are you going with the majority of your country or are you actually against it? And wouldn't you be concerned that by that somehow you are really eliciting something that is not necessarily the indi individual willingness to pay for, um, for this uh, thing. Uh, and um, maybe let's just stop that. You want me to answer? Uh, sure, so if, if you want to. The, the, first question, the next question answer is, would your household be willing to pay an additional, you know, specify the amount for this kind of energy? Yeah. Would your household be willing to pay an additional So the the thing is that when single bounded or what we call referendum, you know, and effort, that's how it's framed. So, so the first one is just a kind of qualitative, right? So in the next question, that is the main valuation question where you assign the bid. A kind of follow-up question. So and to be able to uh, use uh, the models which we've used for the spy and for the model, we need the first question, okay? But couldn't you have framed the first question still as an individual choice instead of everyone in the country has voted? Because I, I, just, I think for individually it's very hard to imagine how do we vote together as a society and what does it mean if I vote yes or no yeah. for an individual purchase? So that was what I was just... Maybe I'm just not... No, maybe. I'm very clearly not so much into the contingent evaluation literature, so it's also an opportunity for me to learn. Uh. No, no, I'm just, you don't have to answer me. This is uh, one of the, the, the main, main comments. The second one, maybe just um, 
that in a sense people had to go through four different scenarios, right? Everyone was asked, you have 300 something people and basically they get to face all of these scenarios uh, and give answers and then you are basically always running them separately. And I was just wondering, does it matter that you have already seen the others? So is there some cross uh, contamination from that you are not just doing one scenario and then making a between subject design, but actually everything is somehow people are seeing the same stuff several times. So they are giving 20 bits in all different types of scenarios. Did you change the order in which you were giving them the first, second, third, fourth, or? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, they are all they are all different, right? Different variations, uh, different amounts, and of course. Uh, in contingent variation, you've got to create a scenario, right? And I mean, it's maybe easier than choice experiment. Choice experiment, where we have maybe up to eight choice sets that look alike and add individuals to you know, make their choices. So, this is relatively easier because, of course, in each of the scenarios, we created this scenario and said, okay, here you can still use your generator, okay? But in the next scenario, you are not going to use your generator. The solar PV will be sufficient for you. So they are all different scenarios and they, don't, they are not related because the individuals know that in the first scenario, okay, they will still make use of their generator, which means they will still incur further cost okay, during blackout. But in the second scenario, they are not going to incur further cost from generators, right? So they will just rely on solar PV. So I think it's, um, it's pretty much simple, it's not complicated. And in the third scenario and the fourth scenario, we say, okay, what if the government gives 20% subsidy? And this 20% subsidy was already incorporated into the bids for those scenarios, okay? So a household is not seeing a lower bid, lower amount, right? And, you know, it's at the same question that we have. So it's simple, it's not that, because at the end of the day, we still ask households, you know. How do you feel about this feature? So, uh, the difficult, the simple, so almost 100 percent says you found it easy. It's like a kind of debriefing question, right? Are you done? I'm, I'm done, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very happy to share with you my comments, but again, they are not so useful. Uh, thank you. Uh, I uh, listened to your presentation with great interest because I'm also interested in. Actually, we got funding to do exactly the same study in the Lagos State. Uh, we're running an RCTU. How do we help? We're focusing more on uh, enterprises. I noticed a problem when I went to Nigeria about a couple of years ago. The use of generators is crazy. I mean, the whole area looks like a war zone when there is, there is no electricity. There's too much electricity production. And then everybody wants these generators that are like 120 that are as big as this. You can carry them outside. The noise it makes the you know the aggregate literally freeze. So that's actually the how I decided I, I have to work on this issue. And then of course we'll talk more. So something that came to my mind now is instead of using like a non-market evaluation method, this is a market book. Like everybody knows about it. Because I went to about 20 stores, uh, like small enterprise, and I said, why are you using the generator? So they oh, very simple. This is $120 to move the generator. But the sort of like to get the same amount of energy because they want it for lighting, charging their phones, and you know, fat basically, and TV problems. Mm -hmm. That's about six, seven hundred. So six, seven times. But there's one big problem here. They don't see actually the amount of fuel and the cost of going to the station and buying fuel. All of that they're not paying attention. Or they're not coming for the coming fires. Actually, the generator would be uh, much more expensive. So long story short, what I think the biggest problem is cost. Like liquidity constraints, the cost and the intervention is clear. We have to come up with a government, uh, like microcredit option for households or firms to pay on a monthly basis and also educate them and show them the benefits. This is the benefit that you get. This is the external cost. Of it. Uh, but now, what I wanted to ask is why these kind of uh, stated preference method on the market? Because they know that they have a good knowledge about the uh, did you consider running like a BDM on a real purchase? I do probably it might be expensive, but at least the idea come to your mind. That's one. And the second and most important question, because you probably know the context better than me, I heard actually from friends that the generator importers, that the lobby group is very popular. 
they corrupt government officials. So the government wouldn't allow actually solar to flood in and kick out the generators. But that's a typical, I don't know to what extent this is true, but I don't know even if this is politically correct to say. Just well, want to hear a fraction. Well, Thank you. You want to say something? I actually have a follow-up question. On that. Okay. <laughs> so, if I must speak correctly, the bits that you gave was based on what you picked up from the pilot, right? If that is correct, the question is, how how realistic were those prices? I mean, were those prices that picked from your bidding study enough to even purchase the solar? So, well, remember it's um, monthly payments, right? Right, monthly. Okay. Now the upfront and payment, right? And in the scenario, so we included say, okay, if the solar bill be cost from this amount to this amount, of course we include it. Okay. Now you will have given the opportunity to pay it monthly. Say maybe for five days. Then after that, you know, you own it. How much? So then this helped us to actually calculate how many years is it gonna um, take households to complete the payment of a typical solar building system which we use in the cost benefit analysis. Okay. And now coming to your question, um just forgot the question. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, why, why not like a VTA, a real purchase experiment? That was one question. Mm -hmm. Is to come up with the solar, you know, uh, home systems as well, and then show the people that how much are you willing to pay for this, mm -hmm. uh, and then sell it based on the VTA. Okay, why, why don't you consider that? So, sort of so, you know, like one of the one of the constraints that I, I did mention is that of affordability. Yeah. Okay, now if you tell household to pay, say. One thousand dollars, okay, to have a solar PV. Then many wouldn't afford that, okay. Uh, but if you say you'll be given the opportunity to spread it, you know, many years, then many would adopt that. Of course, they are already spending on generators and other alternative sources of energy. Yeah, you could do so and say, okay, the cost is one thousand dollars, okay. Are you willing to pay how much maximum amount using open ended your maximum uh, willingness to pay? And you could get answers, but we know that open ended questions also have you know, biases and lots of things that, you know, for instance, cognitive you know, problems, cognitive problems, and there you have many zeros and you have outliers as well. Okay? So, and someone asked, maybe it's related to what. You ask. This is a private good, right? And contingent valuation, the origin, has to do with public good, okay? But in recent times, too, we include uh, pri uh, private goods, especially when you are giving the households the opportunity to pay monthly, and you do not know how much they are willing to pay, so you need to exit it. Okay? Sorry. Uh, sorry, 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 yeah. just to stop you. I, I would like to invite you to. Up uh, after the end of the session, because now we are out of time and now the German is coming out of me. So, uh, yeah, did you are doing the same. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I think you are just happy points. Yeah. Yes. So, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> I misunderstood you. <laughs> just as I misunderstood you, sorry. Okay. So, now the last presentation. And uh, it is joint work with. Uh, so let me introduce uh, you also to my co-authors, Henry, uh, who carried this paper and was part of his PhD project and who is now running around in DC and searching for a job. Um, Christoph, who um, is a data scientist who has contributed in, um, especially in the machine learning parts, uh, and Friederike, who, uh, who's a postdoc and basically came up with the idea for this paper, and I'm allowed to present it now today, so um, let's have a look. So what are we looking at? What is the problem we are looking at is uh, we are thinking about uh, how households cope with climate change. Uh, and so we know from the literature that climate change is going to lead to very large adjustment costs in agriculture. Many dimensions to which they are adopting. And we are going to look at a very specific dimension that hasn't been studied a lot. Um, th this type of diversification is costly and also depends on a lot of characteristics and we are looking, uh, going to look at one very specific way how diversification happens and this is going to be through solar, solar panels and through small scale businesses that you see on the third picture which is basically this is a household where a small bar and cinema 
are being run uh, by a solar panel and where the small scale business is being operated. Our location is going to be Tanzania and we are going to look at uh, households' uh, behavior, behavior based on um, very unusual, let's put it that way, data. Uh, we are going to observe uh, exclusively um, um, rural uh, farmers. All of them are going to own a solar panel. So by that, uh, it's a very selected sample, it's a very specific uh, sample of uh, households, but we are going to look at about 20,000 farmer households. Uh, who all of them uh, had access to solar panel from a specific firm. Uh, we are going to identify crop shocks, that's going to be our economic shock, and we are going to observe these, panel, these households' daily repayment behavior, because they are buying the solar panel on credit and they are charging their panel daily, uh, which is part of the repayment of the panel. So it's a pay-as-you-go system that this company is operating, and we are observing the income stream of these households. By that, we are using this observation of the income stream uh, to measure how they are responding, how their cash flows are responding to agricultural shocks. So we are going to look at the crop shock, and we are going to look at uh, uh, households rolling with payment. But additionally, what we are interested in is to figure out what these households are doing with their solar panel, and especially whether they are operating a business, some type of uh, small scale, scale businesses. And so we are going to try to infer it from data whether households are running a small scale business. And then, of course, we would like to understand, does it help? Which is, this part is going to be the most descriptive, but still we would like to somehow link it back and say, okay, so if households do that and use solar panels as a shock coping strategy, does it help them also to improve their cash flows for, um, over time? We are also going to look a bit at adjustment dynamics and originalities. Um, in terms of contributions, um, the main contribution is the type of data or the type of question that we are trying to answer with this data because we are using extremely high resolution, high frequency data on actual behavior by farmers. Uh, we, are, uh, we have received access uh, from an unnamed solar panel company, solar panel home system provider company, uh, of their full customer database. So basically, we know every 10 minutes how these households are drawing on the solar panel because the solar panel is pinging uh, the company every 10 minutes and so we got, we got the full database and by that we know about their electricity consumption uh, at a very high resolution. I'm going to tell you how we are going to use this. Um, and we are also having daily repayment data, so again some uh, um, data that we can then utilize to learn something about uh, farmers' cash flows that we usually might not be able to learn about if you are just looking at um, survey data that is uh, uh, much more granular or much less granular. And we are looking at a new technology, which is the solar panels um, for income source divers diversification. Um, and uh, as a byproduct, we are identifying, we, we had to come up with some ways how to identify very, very local, location-specific uh, um, vegetation shocks uh, by measuring plant health. Our data provider is a solar panel company in Tanzania, not to be named, they didn't agree to um, actually give their name um, publicly. Uh, they are selling solar panels and appliances on loan uh, in several East African countries, targeting low-income households in rural areas, um, in areas where on average uh, electricity access is about one-fourth, 25% of all households uh, have access to electricity, they are offering a very high flexibility repayment. So basically, households can pay as, uh, as they go and by charging their panel daily, uh, they can repay the panel uh, home system after a couple of years. Um, when they haven't paid, uh, the system is uh, shutting off. So they are charging the panel, um, they, they are using the panel, and they can also um, experience times of shut off, so for a couple of days up to uh, months, when they couldn't be able to uh, make the next charge. Uh, after a while, this known repayment is going to trigger a deinstallation, but it's, it takes quite a lot of time, so uh, we are going to look at the first uh, um, shorter period of known repayment where it's really just about cash flow, but households are not losing their uh, access to panel. And just to imagine, these are relatively small panels, and these are the type of appliances that the, uh, that the firm is selling with them, so uh, especially mobile phone chargers, uh, but also lights uh, or um, uh, televisions. Uh, television sets are important appliances. Uh, the firm is very uh, specific about um, manipulating the system so that you cannot use these appliances uh, with other panels, 
and also you cannot use this panel with other appliances. So it's building up an ecosystem of uh, uh, consumer goods and uh, panels. So we are observing 20,000 rural farmers uh, in Tan uh, rural Tanzania for about four years, from 2015 to 18, uh, in 133 districts and about 2,000 wards. And we are going to look at shocks, agricultural shocks, that are going to be ward specific. So by that, they are going to be extremely localized. Why is it relevant, especially because in Tanzania you have all the different uh, climatic zones. In, in some of them you have uh, just one rainy season, in others you have two. So the, also the um, um, weather shocks are much more local, local and our measurement of the weather shocks is going to be much more local. We are still observing daily repayment and electricity consumption, as I said, at every 10 minutes. And we are going to utilize also a household survey, um, a specialized survey that was asking especially about uh, electricity use and whether households use it for business purposes in order to infer them from the other data, whether other households might be using the data panels also for electricity. So how do we measure stuff? Um, first of all, we had to define, you know, come up with our own definitions of growing seasons because they change extremely in space. So we were first trying to figure out based on the literature, but at the end we ended up with a data-driven process. Um, and we are defining seasons based on historical rainfall data. And not the starting time of the seasons, but just the length of the seasons. So we are coming up with the idea how long in each ward a usual growing season um, <laughs> how, how, how long does it go? Um, and then taking the same fixed length and triggering the start of the season every year then when we observe that at least 5% of usual rainfall has, uh, has uh, been materialized. Um, we are measuring crop shocks using NDVI data, which is model data, uh, which just uh, uh, captures the greenness uh, of areas based on satellite images. Um, and we are measuring the shocks basically to how you imagine if this is just one word. Uh, we define the length of the growing season based on 20 years of historical data. Um, then, and these are the, uh, and the, then we trigger, so the length of all these uh, um, gray uh, bars, that's our growing season. The, and the length of the gray bar is always the same, the width of this bar. Uh, then we trigger the start of the season, then when uh, the first rainfall has fallen, the rainfall you see it in blue in the back, uh, and then we are measuring uh, NDVI, this is the green line, throughout this season, and compare it to the historical NDVI through growing seasons, which is the orange one, and we are calculating a deviation. So basically what we are ending up with, here you see these years, 16, 17, 18, in 18 plants, and plant health was substantially worse than in, uh, in 16 or, uh, no, not 18, sorry. In 17, the deviation is substantially larger than in the other years, and by that, that's our localized, location-specific agricultural shock, crop shock that we are looking at. Why, this crop shock is much more precise than just looking at deviation from, uh, of rainfall, because it really looks at plant, uh, plant health. Um, could be, we were discussing before, could be because of locusts, could be of other pests that were uh, happening that are not so closely correlated with rain. And we are standardizing um, this measure, but basically then uh, we are looking at how many standard deviations um, are we losing uh, in terms of uh, crop health uh, in a given uh, season. That's just one selected year, 2017, and that's a spatial distribution of, uh, of, the, uh, of these crop shocks over our about 2,000 wards. Um, that's the shock variable. Our dependent variable is going to be cash flow. It's going to be based on repayment. And the, here uh, on this customer base, we are basically looking at how quickly they are repaying, or, or not how quickly they are repaying, but whether they are stopping repayment in certain uh, periods. So we are basically proxying by that uh, for cash constraints. We are looking at the number of days that the panel has been shut off. The panel uh, is going to be shut off then when uh, non-repayment is triggering a shut off. Um, and we are also looking at other uh, measurements like how many, what is the average charge day statistic. Just to show you how does it look like, this is repayment data for two selected customers. So you see, uh, see then when the panel gets charged, then it takes you a couple of days up to a week uh, up to a month. So on the left-hand side, there is someone who has 
been charging monthly, and then at the end of the month when, it's, uh, when the whole charge has expired, a new charge is coming, um, until most likely this person um, changed the employment status and started charging at very, very high frequencies, very little. So that these are very, very, um, the panel can be charged basically daily. Um, and if you, and you see that there are some gaps, and in the gaps, basically there is no charge, so the panel has been shut off. And that's our measure of cash flow differences. How many days has the panel been shut off? So here on the right hand side, a person has been charging, uh, again, monthly, then a lot of tiny charges, and then it's basically getting shut off. So, uh, there is, um, substantial uh, um, income difficulties that this person is coming in and basically the, the, the panel gets abandoned. We are looking at the first 30 days uh, until the default, so we are basically focusing on the very quick um, small recharges and that's what we are taking as, a, as an indication of, uh, of um, um, payment difficulties. The third part of the story is what are people using their panels for? And that's coming from the high uh, resolution uh, usage data, solar panels that, that, that we are uh, getting. Um, and there, we are basically looking at yearly, uh, not yearly, daily patterns of electricity consumption. So we are looking at how people use their energy. We are aggregating it by hour because it's just way too much data. So we have terabytes and terabytes of data. And we are looking at the hourly intensity of usage in two different dimensions, so high and low, uh, low voltage electricity. And here you see four different customers. Um, two of them, we know they are business users because um, based on a, a specialized survey, they have been reporting on their um, uh, what type of businesses they are running. Uh, other two customers are private users, so Orange Business Group uh, private. And you see that all of these uh, customers have very different patterns of electricity usage. Some use electricity at night, others use it mostly in the afternoon to possibly, possibly power up some uh, type of, let's say, um, um, home cinema or... Um, it really depends. The patterns of usage depend on what type of, uh, um, of uh, uh, business they are um, also running. And so we have survey data on a very small set of customers, 314, and we take 100 days before this survey for these 314 uh, customers to see how did they use their electricity daily um, and try to infer, so try to predict them, them being business customers so using a, a machine learning algorithm. Um, that's just how electricity, average electricity profiles look like. Uh, what you also see, the orange is the non-business and the, the blues are business users. So you see that business users in general, in general use more electricity than non-business users. Um, and in order to make sure that that's not the only difference that is somehow triggering and driving our models, we are also going to uh, control for average uh, electricity use as a different proxy to say we are really trying to focus on business users. It's not just about how much electricity someone is using, because if someone is using more electricity, these people could value electricity much more, so there could be something else going on um, in this setting than what we are interested in. So our predictive model, I, I, in 20 minutes, I just cut out uh, the technical part. So basically, on the left-hand side, you see our training data. On the right-hand side, you see our test sample. It already shows you that even for known business users, um, not on all days are we predicting that they are going to use, uh, uh, so they are going to run a business. We are very good at distinguishing private users from business users, not that good at predicting business users throughout. Okay. Baseline model, we are estimating on the left hand side uh, either uh, off days, so basically um, payment difficulties, or the share of business usage days on individual fixed effects. We are observing the same person over several years, over several, after several harvest seasons. We are always taking the one major harvest season per year. And we are uh, looking at first the re relationship between a shock, which is board specific, um, and we do have some additional controls. And we are looking at within district here, so there is a very specific, location-specific variation. Um, main results uh, on the left-hand side, that's a proxy for system of days, so basically that's a proxy for payment difficulties, and it's positively, clearly positively related to shocks, so in time of shock, uh, after every agriculture shocks, households are much more likely to switch off the panel. You know, on the right-hand side, they're also more likely, not much, it's a relatively small effect, but they are, uh, there is a significant increase in the probability that they are going to 
use electricity in patterns that are related to uh, business usage. So basically, the likelihood of business usage is also increasing after in a harvest season that is coming uh, after a, a, a worse uh, agricultural season. So some people are actually powering up their solar panels and using it to generate electricity when income doesn't materialize in the harvest season. Um, and this part is the most descriptive one, which is just a mediator analysis to try to figure out whether those who are uh, business, business users B um, are responding to a shock differently. So in a sense, being a business user is endogenous, it's a response, and we are just interacting this endogenous response to, uh, with the shock to try to see whether those who are actually really changing their behavior um, are um, differently affected. And what you see is basically that uh, business users, that's the first coefficient, that's the baseline, business users are much less likely to run into problems in general, which is, again, they value uh, their uh, panel much more, they are possibly wealthier and all that. Uh, vegetation shocks put people into worse conditions, um, but vegetation shocks put business users um, into worse conditions to a, less, to a lesser extent. And we are interacting these shocks also with a lot of individual characteristics to see it's really not just being richer or being different um, that makes this shock response, but it's something about business usage that basically allows for some additional cash flow. Um, to look at so to have some robustness checks, and especially we were asking ourselves, is it really a business usage that we are measuring, or is it just something a fork in the data that we are uh, picking up by this uh, whole procedure? And so we were looking at uh, the quantity of usage as a confounding factor, and that's not it, because business usage is correlated with the, the quantity of electricity used, but actually they are going into even two different directions. We are interacting shocks with a lot of customer characteristics and also locational characteristics to see it's not just something location-specific or, or person-specific, but it's really related to business usage. And just to the question, who is adjusting their behavior, uh, we are um, looking at different types of heterogeneities, and the one that um, maybe I just want to draw your attention to is on the left-hand side, that's basically re remoteness. How distant they are to the city, and remoteness is also very closely related to access to electricity, actually, in general. And so what you see that it's especially the, in the very remote places where people are actually um, able still to generate income through selling electricity, electricity to their neighbors, or selling some electricity power services to their neighbors. And that's also, um, so additional, my time is still a couple of seconds, basically. Um, uh, so farmers adjust more in less saturated regions. So there, where there are not so many people with electricity uh, access, actually. Um, they do not adjust in a precautionary savings manner. So there is no adjustment during the growing season when the shop, sorry, when the shop realizes that's what we were expecting somehow, that people start adjusting their behavior in a precautionary manner. We don't see any uh, evidence for that. It's really after when uh, the income doesn't really materialize in the harvest season. Um, and my time is basically over. So uh, just to conclude, um, I just want to point out one point which is um, relevant as a policy conclusion. This type of selling electricity power services that seems to help people to cope with uh, uh, negative drought shocks is, of course, could vanish in a general equilibrium as soon as everyone has access to electricity. Because in a sense, it's really just a coping transitory strategy that people can use as long as all the others around them don't have the same electricity access. So we are identifying, and for us, interest in coping strategy, a new, new shock coping strategy, but again, we don't expect it to stay once uh, everyone has access to electricity. Thanks. Thank you very much for the correct presentation. Um, I really love the paper. Uh, I've been working in Tanzania for the past 10 years, and we're seeing on the ground the impacts of climate change on farmers and the lack of predictability of the rainy season now compared to 10 years ago. Uh, so I really love the, the topic and the fact that you're using different types of data, uh, trying to go beyond uh, survey data. Um, 
My first question is about related to the data, uh, and it was seen increasingly in a number of papers using customer data, and I was wondering how do you get consent from uh, the customers, um, and how do you deal with that for this type of research? Um, that's the first question. Um, and then also I would like to understand a bit more the level of analysis. So you have customer level data, and we're trying to say something about farmers' behavior, so at the household level somehow, uh, because we very often have a farming households. So um, I think I'm missing a link in the paper, like this connection between the customer data and the farming household. Especially um, in the paper, at some point you say that you have 16% of women, but are they those making the farming decisions, or did they just put the name of the contract under the woman's uh, name? And I think, I mean, the paper could clarify this, maybe. Um, also, there are a couple of decisions you're taking by constructing your data set. Um, I was not too sure of the motivations and implications um, for the findings. So, the fact that you are only accounting for households with, with one credit line, uh, the fact that uh, you're excluding those who um, don't really use the system much, uh, and also those who have the most expensive system, um, and also excluding those who um, took more than a year to repay. Uh, and I feel that it's such an important question that, I mean, for Tanzania and other countries, that we need to understand how much we can, the external validity of your findings. And I think it has to be explicit because, I, I mean, a paper like this, I think, it, I mean, from a policy perspective, it's just great. And, and we need to know if the fact that we're using one company and then making all those decisions, what can we say about the findings? Is it restricted to only this sample or can we say something for the wider country? Um, and my final comment is about um, the profitability of those activities. Um, and again, I'm not sure I get it. It's so we know what they do, but we don't know if the activities are profitable and allow them to actually cope with the, the shock. And something that you also mentioned in the presentation is that those shocks are especially correlated uh, and related to this, like if all the farming households in a village or in a war in Tanzania are affected by the same climate shocks, if one decides to do more like, off farm activities and the neighborhood does the same, I mean, we're economists, we know what happens. Um, so, if you can say a bit about this as well. Uh, but again, I really love the paper, I think it's great. And we go, I mean, I love reading all the details, really nice to present it. So, yeah, well done. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Um, maybe just very quickly, customer data, how do you get consent? I could ask you the same, just to put it back. Of course, so everything is anonymized, so you don't even know the firm, you can't really identify anyone. So in that sense, there is, of course, some, uh, there are some boundaries, so we, we couldn't be anonymized anything, but absolutely, we, we, I, I get that. So whenever you are working with admin data, no one agreed to this explicitly, right? So. Um, Again, um, my colleague Federic is running experiments on, uh, with the same company on the same customer base, and then as soon as you are doing RCTs, yes, uh, you are getting uh, explicit consent. Um, here, maybe they tick the box somewhere, but basically, of course, they don't know that. In, in a sense, I'm absolutely right. I, I, get, I get it. I think it's there. We have to acknowledge, but I, I can't nicely revoke it. You and I no. right? Okay, no. yeah. <laughs> Good. Um, um, we have made a lot of decisions uh, to construct the data set, that is true. Many of them are not relevant because we are really trying, trying out and looking at whether it's, our results are robust to how we put it together. It's not changing results that much, but it's making it cleaner to construct. So at the end, we were always making these decisions. So for, for instance, people with several credit lines, it's getting extremely um, noisy, so there are not so many, so we were actually very happy to um, at the end to say, okay, we are just focusing on those who just bought it once and not sell it, for instance. But yes, your point is very well taken. And the profitability of those activities, um, I don't think these activities are profitable. I think it's really just a bench. So if we are really observing that they are doing this 
and they're not staying a lot. So those who have done this in the past are not more likely to do this in the future. So we're trying to figure out whether people are being drawn into business, small-scale business, and they are going to stay on doing small-scale business, and we don't see that. So it's really just like more like a very quick bridging activity of desperation where you are basically then starting charging phones or starting doing something and selling electricity to your neighbors. And if you say, what about everyone has been hit by a shock? So we really see this adjustment, but as, you, uh, as I was also commenting on it, we see it much more in places where there is an awful lot of planets. So in, in that sense, there is basically somehow a reallocation within the community. And if you see it from a policy making perspective, that just do we know that this, uh, uh, that this uh, really economic exchange and not just uh, friends helping out the poorest one? We don't, right? So, in a sense, we are observing that there is some business like electricity generation, but we don't know whether it's really a truly market exchange or whether it's uh, um, more of a different uh, diversification strategy. I think it's a very valid point. Um, I think we can begin also by the. Uh, Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I also worked in Tanzania, and uh, I'm a former PhD student. We did, uh, uh, thank you. So we did a study on electrification. Nobody was connecting, actually, it was a challenge some seven, eight years ago, and then one of the recommendations was decentralized solar uh, technology. So I'm very happy with that this kind of picked up and did research on that. But my question is not directly related to the research question. But is there any uh, way to test if households use this technology to cope with like heat stress and things like that? Like using fans, for example. Uh, if that is, that evidence is there, then this is also a very interesting adaptation story. Well, thank you. I, I, I don't know, but uh, of course one could uh, very easily measure that. Yeah, thank because they're affected by heat waves uh, quite, especially those close to right, right now, I would say that because they are not actually going, like, no, I don't know. Good point. I just think. Thanks a lot. Interesting there. Um, something on the creation of the climate shocks. So, um, can you distinguish between positive and negative shocks? Because from the side, if I read it right, you're basically seeing the impact of dispersion. Uh, so, standard deviation failures. Whereas, I mean, if this is temperature, then really, yes, it matters whether it shifts a lot around the person and not to me, but we're using NDI, which is directly from health, meaning I would imagine the impact of a negative shock would be very different than the impact of a positive shock. We are just measuring negative shocks. We are not treating positive shocks as shocks. So we are basically, um, whenever there is something positive, we are just taking it as business as usual. So we are really just looking at the negative, okay. the downside risk. But... Okay, great. Thanks. And slightly connected, do you study spatial correlation? Because they will be spatial correlated. And whether this can be absorbed by the district. So, in a sense, we are really just looking at very fine within district uh, variation because everything else is absorbed. Um, and so, the big spatially correlated shocks are not even part of this identification strategy in a sense because it's really just looking at fine variation within one district uh, through the board. But uh, we have been playing around also with clustering standard errors, so it's, uh, it's, it's not driven by that. There is someone in the back, I think, Philip, right? And now you're giving us one additional minute because um, the, the Germany mean is dying, now we are one minute over. <laughs> okay, that is very, very impressive data, very good paper. I was wondering about the shut off as a proxy for income. And well, there could be another story, like, for example, there could be substitution, right? In the event of an agricultural shock, you might. Shift your assets into preserving your income as you can for going some. Uh, you could be going outside. So, in a sense, it could also be um, that you have to, but if, if you are giving this income as a, as a proxy for an income shock, you could be leaving your household and your valuation of the solar panel could change because now you have to go somewhere else, you have to work on someone else's field, uh, you have to move somewhere, and it's, it's in a harvest period. So. Um, you have to go to maybe to the city to actually generate some other income. In that case, you could also let your uh, solar panel die. Die, I mean, not die, but you, you shut off. Uh, so that could be also something that we are not observing. It could be behind it that, in a sense, valuation also plays in. Thank you. Thank you.
Yeah, that's that's I think it doesn't take any way. That's just maybe an additional thing for the report. Very interesting. Thank you. Um, our time is over, but if uh, you want to um, make any comments to any of us, basically, we would be very, very happy to actually just keep on discussing. Uh, I hope you are going to enjoy the rest of the conference as well, and uh, looking forward to all of the interesting presentations and discussions. Thanks for being here. Thank you.